morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be back and I hope to contribute something today on the front of some basic concepts uh, regarding MCQs and the topic that I have chosen for these MCQs is UVR. Uh, please excuse my throat. I'm just recovering from a viral illness, so I'll try to be as clear as possible. But if you don't understand anything, note it down and we can discuss it at the end of the uh, session. So this is the first question. I have picked up these questions from different MCQ books. And now from this time on, we will be having uh, multiple choice questions, even in your uh, professional examination. And we will also be dealing with clinical sort of scenarios in the NEAT PG exam. So I hope this will help. So the first question is intermediate uveitis involves inflammation of which of the following parts? Pars plicata, pars plana, iris or vitreous. Now, all these structures are in very close proximity of each other and hence there can be some confusion when you think about answering this question. Pars plicata is the part which has about 70 or 80 finger-like projections, which are called the ciliary processes. And from these ciliary processes, we get the aqueous, which forms the anterior chamber. This is in close conjunction with the zonules, which lead it to its attachment on the lens. Pars plana is ahead of pars plicata, and it is a relatively plain part, which is in opposition to the uh, vitreous. And then we have the iris, which is the brown part. So iris, pars plicata, and eventually pars plana in, a, in close conjunction with vitreous. Now, intermediate uveitis is a condition which has these salient features. Now, if you remember these six salient features, you will be able to answer questions related to this entity. It has vitreous cells. There are inflammatory cells in the vitreous, which you can see on a slit lamp. It has these two terms related to snow, snowballs and snow banking. There is vasculitis. That means the retinal blood vessels are inflamed and you can see a short, sort of sheathing around them. There is periarteritis. There is uh, inflammation of arteries uh, in the retina. And there is a membrane on the ciliary body, which is called as the cyclitic membrane. So what is snow banking? The snow banking is this white deposition that you see when you see a fully dilated fundus. And this is accumulation of cream vitreous exudates over the pars plana region and the peripheral retina in pars planitis. Now here I've used the word over the pars plana region. So it is giving you the clue that probably pars plana is the culprit. And then we have another term which is called as snowballs, which refers to focal whitish ball-like collections of immune and inflammatory cells. So immune cells and inflammatory cells, they clump together and these are also called as ant eggs. So if you have a question in which you have these options that which clinical condition has snow banking as its characteristic feature, the answer would be intermediate uveitis. But there is a catch here. Now, our options had only pars plana, pars plicata, iris, or vitreous. There is a body which is given this standardization of uveitis nomenclature. And according to this, intermediate uveitis is a subset of uveitis where vitreous is the major site of inflammation. And if there is an associated infection, such as Lyme disease, or if there is a systemic disease, such as sarcoidosis. Now, this entity is just involving the anterior vitreous. This is associated with a systemic disease most of the times. Otherwise, we use the word pars planitis. Now, pars planitis is inflammation of pars plana, but it is idiopathic. It is not associated with a frank systemic disease. So if you have a very technical element to the question, 
inflammation of pars plana idiopathic with no systemic disease the answer is pars planitis but if somebody is going very technically as per the latest qual- uh, uh, classification then we will write intermediate uveitis is basically inflammation of pars plana with associated vitreous in presence of a systemic disease essentially both are same but if there is a cause then it is intermediate uveitis if there is no cause then we just call it pars planitis simplistically put so our answer actually should have been pars plana with anterior vitreous so intermediate uveitis is the inflammation of pars plana with surrounding anterior vitreous but since anterior vitreous was not an option along with pars plana we will go just with pars plana now you will ask me why don't we just choose vitreous we don't choose just vitreous as the answer because that could imply to vitreous anywhere so the thing is the vitreous that is attached to the pars plana region once it gets infected once there are inflammatory cells or immune cells there and there is swelling of the pars plana to which this vitreous is attached then only we call it intermediate uveitis coming over to the next question one of the earliest features of anterior uveitis includes keratic precipitates hypopion posterior synecap or aqueous flare to be able to answer this question you first must know what are each of these individual entities so cell and flare whenever there is inflammation happening in the iris in the ciliary body or both of them together that is the iris ciliary body complex we have aqueous cells as an early and definitive sign of active inflammation because of the inflammation the blood vessels in this area they become leaky and they leak in aqueous cells aqueous flare is the translucence of the aqueous due to the high albumin content and the proteins which are leaking from the uvea and also from these cells due to the breakdown of blood aqueous barrier so the first sign is aqueous flare right this is an indefinite sign of active inflammation keratinic precipitates as you can see here they are stuck on the back side of the cornea on the corneal endothelium and they are nothing but aggregation or clumps of inflammatory cells now if in a question you have a particular description of the keratinic precipitates which are also called as kps in short you can figure out if they are talking about an acute inflammation or an old inflammation so if the keratinic precipitates are white and perfectly round that means they are of an acute inflammation they are acute kps if they are faded out and their margins are irregular or crenated it means that they are dying out so they are old kps now when they are very large plumpy oily or greasy looking that means they are laden with macrophages and epithelioid cells and they are called as mutton fat kps and they are there because of a granulomatous sclerocyclitis so mutton fat kps can come as a separate mcq also wherein it just they, you would be asked whether it is related to non granulomatous sclerocyclitis or granulomatous sclerocyclitis or acute or chronic so usually it is seen in chronic granulomatous sclerocyclitis in some cases like where there is viral uveitis we have bleeding also so we have hemorrhages or hyphema so there the hemorrhagic uveitis has red colored kps so that can also point towards the etiology of the sclerocyclitis these are posterior synecap the attachment of the iris to the lens the adhesions which are there uh, they can be because of a nodule which has gotten stuck to the iris 
or a thickened iris because of its inflammatory content or the inflammatory exudate it gets stuck to the anterior lens capsule these are called as posterior synechiae so for posterior synechiae to form the inflammation has to be ongoing for a little bit of time therefore posterior synechiae cannot be an early sign of arachidocyclitis as was the question even keratotic precipitates take time to form so they can also not be a early sign of the uh, of the uh, arachidocyclitis now let's come to the word flare flare as we talked about is leaky protein from the cells or from the blood vessels of the iris now how do we see this flare it's actually a proteinaceous deposit so normally with an oblique illumination of the slit lamp which is the instrument which most ophthalmologists use and you would have seen it in your ophthalmology department we make a very small beam in a semi lit room the beam is of about 1 mm into 1 mm normally if you see you would see only two light reflections one on the cornea and one on the anterior lens surface but if you have a whitish beam between these two reflections this is the corneal reflection this is the lenticular reflection if you have a whitish beam between these two reflections because of the tindall effect and you see cellular movement like a brownian motion then this white beam refers to presence of flare so the correct answer for this question is aqueous flare is the earliest sign of acute arachidocyclitis now sometimes you can get additional phrases in this sort of a question to confuse you the question can be what is the earliest sign of active anterior uveitis when you have the addition of the word active then the answer become aqueous cells other questions can be in the form of what is the hallmark of anterior uveitis then again the answer is aqueous cells because it is the aqueous cells that are leaking out from the blood vessels because of breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier and if you get a question where the statement is what is the most pathonomic sign of anterior uveitis then the answer is kps because kps are not formed in any other condition sometimes you can be asked to categorize uveitis um, what is the definition of like acute uveitis or recurrent uveitis now remember the arachidocyclitis or the anterior uveitis or intermediate uveitis they can be of sudden onset or they can be insidious if they may be called as of limited duration if the duration is less than 3 months but if they extend beyond 3 months then they are called as persistent uveitis so less than 3 limited more than 3 persistent acute means that the episode is characterized by sudden onset symptoms of redness pain cellular reaction and there is a limited duration the impact of the symptoms is such that the patient comes to you immediately with these symptoms these can be recurrent but to call them recurrent we have to remember that there have to be repeated episodes which are separated by a period of inactivity unwell well and then again unwell so then only we call it recurrent without any treatment being given in the period when the patient was well in between for about 3 months duration it's called as chronic when there is persistent inflammation for more than 3 uh, months without with a relapse of less than 3 month duration either the inflammation is continuing for more than 3 months or the patient was unwell then well but well for less than 3 months and he still needed some sort of a therapy in this so called wellness phase and again he had full full fledged um, unwell inflammation in the eye so that's chronic uveitis coming to the third question in anterior uveitis the pupil is generally normal size well if everything is normal why is there uveitis the 
iris is inflamed it is going to release some cells the inflammatory product from the iris is going to get stuck to the anterior lens surface so of course the pupil cannot stay normal then we have an option which is constricted pupil dilated pupil or normal shape now the pupil can become dilated not properly dilated like a full brown dilation but irregularly dilated in response to the atropine that we give as a treatment to patients with anterior uveitis usually pupil is constricted because of the inflammatory exudates that are released from the iris they they go and act directly on the iris sphincter muscle and make the pupil get stuck to the anterior lens capsule so this is what actually happens so the answer is constricted or myosed pupil if you try to put atropine or say a uh, home atropine in a patient who ha- is having uveitis then the parts which are stuck which are having synechia they do not respond to the atropine but the so called normal parts in between these synechia they dilate now this normal abnormal normal abnormal contour that is formed after a midriatic gives the appearance of a festooned pupil so festooned pupil is also a characteristic sign of uveitis sometimes because of synechia and because of repeated inflammation pupil becomes very irregular in shape and the patient can also develop a complicated cataract so these are the other telltale signs irregular pupil or festooned pupil or associated with a complicated cataract these are also some uh, telltale signs of a chronic iridocyclitis or a chronic uveitis right so these have to be remembered and even if everything becomes resolved after treatment the pupil of an eye which had uveitis or iridocyclitis it becomes slightly slow to dilate afterwards following therapy with a tropicamide or any other dilator drop that you give as compared to the normal eye because it has already been subjected to so much of inflammation earlier that it loses its sphincteric contraction power so it becomes slightly slow to dilate the fourth question is fluffy deposits are seen in alts triangle in which condition so we have four conditions listed here trachoma granulomatous uveitis toxoplasmosis and herpetic uveitis we will be able to answer this question only if you know what is alts triangle if you don't know this then none of this will you know help you guess the answer alts triangle is nothing but a sort of a wedge shaped area with its apex towards the center of the cornea and its base towards the inferior part of the cornea now what happens is that the aqueous has some convection currents aqueous tries to rise up to the warmer part of the central cornea but by virtue of gravity it comes down and since the inferior part of the cornea is slightly uh, of a cooler temperature than the central part of the cornea most of the deposition happens in this area so aqueous currents rise up but since it's warm and there is gravity and there is cooler temperature here it settles down so this is the alts triangle and if we have mutton fat kps in the alts triangle it is characteristic of a chronic granulomatous inflammatory process so the correct answer to this question would be granulomatous uveitis now sometimes you can get other word uh, uh, questions uh, with alts in them so if you have alts line it's a linear scar which is there in the sulcus subtarsalis following a trachoma infection alts operation is another term that you might get as a question it involves transplantation of eyelashes from the edge of the eyelid for treatment of distichiasis alts syndrome is nothing but another word for trachoma and alts triangle as i told you is that triangular wedge shaped area where keratotic precipitates they get deposited 
closer to the inferior corneal endothelium by virtue of the convection currents of the aqueous. The next question involves nodules. Now, uh, in the newer NEAT PG uh, exams, you can even get image-based questions. So you can get an image of um, iris with these nodules stuck to the pupillary margin. So Copy's nodules are basically found at the pupillary margin. These are nothing but ectodermal nodules, and they are not characteristic of any particular form of a uveitis. They are seen both in non-granulomatous as well as granulomatous uveitis. So these are Copy's nodules stuck to the pupillary margin. There are some other nodules also, which you must know. We have something called as Berlin's nodules. They are seen at the root of the iris, the part where iris is attached. Sometimes you see nodules there which are vascularized. So nodules at the root of the iris are seen in sarcoidosis. If you are suspecting a patient to have sarcoidosis, then you must do a gonioscopy also. When you do gonioscopy, you may find Berlin's nodules in the anterior chamber angle. Osaka's nodules are very typically seen in granulomatous uveitis. They are present in the mid-periphery. So you have multiple inflammatory nodules in the mid-periphery of the iris seen in patients which is who is having other signs such as KPs, mutton fat KPs or granulomatous uveitis. Unlike Copy's nodules, these are mesodermal in origin. So you can get an embryology question also wherein they will ask you about the origin of Osaka's nodules or Copy's nodules. So remember, Copy's is ectodermal, Osaka's is mesodermal. Iris roseola, like this, a very uh, inflamed vascular pinkish nodule. These are seen in syphilitic uveitis. So Berlin's nodules in sarcoidosis, Busaka's typically in granulomatous uveitis, and iris roseola in syphilitic uveitis. Some other nodules, Dehlenfuck nodules are very much seen in patients with sympathetic ophthalmia. These are seen in the periphery of the retina. So you have these nodular uh, granulomas between the uh, Brooks membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium in patients with sympathetic ophthalmitis. Sympathetic ophthalmitis, if you all remember from your books, is a condition which happens after trauma to one eye. So the other eye can also develop an inflammatory response and this condition is known as sympathetic uveitis or sympathetic ophthalmitis and it can also occur following certain surgeries. Then we have these small Lish nodules in patients with neurofibromatosis. So in these patients, you will not have other signs of inflammation. Uh, say, for example, if you say uh, they look like Musaka's nodules to me, but Musaka's nodules are in a granulomatous condition. So in the rest of the eye also, you will have signs of granulomatous in, uh, iridocyclitis, like KPs and you will have inflammatory cells and flare. But Lish nodules do not have any signs of inflammation in the eye and they have other telltale signs of neurofibromatosis in the body. So you can have uh, uh, patchy hypopigmentation of the skin or other hematomas anywhere else in the body. So for Copy's nodules, the answer was iris or pupillary margin. The next question involves secondary glaucoma which happens following an attack of iridocyclitis. Now, how can we manage this? This can be managed by, now, look at the word except. So always read the first line properly so that you can pick up except questions and not answer by mistake on the other way. So secondary glaucoma due to acute attack of aridocyclitis can be managed by following except corticosteroids, beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or myotics. Now corticosteroids are anti-inflammatory. They have to be given beta blockers and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. They reduce the aqueous production from an already inflamed ciliary process and ciliary body, and they help to control the pressure. But myotics are pro-inflammatory and therefore 
should not be given. Already we have our idocyclitis. We have so much of inflammation. We don't want to give a drug which is going to increase the inflammation. Another drug which is pro-inflammatory is prostaglandin analogs like letinoprost, travoprost, bimatoprost. These drugs should not be given in acutely inflamed eye. So myotics and prostaglandin analogs are two categories of anti-glaucoma drugs which are not given in an inflamed eye. Remember this. Next question. What is the standard beam setting used in the standardized uveitis nomenclature grading system? Now, we talked about grading cells and flare to categorize the amount of inflammation that is there in the eye. So we are going to see some flare in between the two beams. Now, how do we know that this is the exact number of cells and flare? For that, there is a standard beam size. And in that beam width, we measure the cells or the flare that is there. So as per the sun grading system, the standard beam setting is 1 into 1 millimeter. That's the correct answer. So when you focus the beam, as I mentioned earlier too, we get a reflection from the cornea. There is a space in between the reflection from the lens and the reflection from the cornea. So in this space, we are going to count the cells and the flare. Another question on a similar line can be, aqueous cells will be graded as 3 plus. They can write 3 times plus or they can write numerical 3 with a plus if the number of cells in AC is and then you will be given some numerical options. So for this question and a similar question on aqueous flare, it is important that you remember this grading system for AC cells and flare. It will help you answer most of the questions on uveitis. So when you see a high power field with one millimeter by one millimeter slit beam, number of cells is labeled as zero if it is less than one cell per high power field. If it's 1 to 5, we call it 0. 0.5 cell. If it's 6 to 15, 1 plus, 16 to 25, 2 plus, 26 to 53 plus, and more than 54 plus. How to remember? If you try to remember like this, you will forget. Less than 1, 1, 5, 15, 1 and 5, 15, then 25, 50, and more than 50. So less than 1, 5, 15, 25, 50 and more than 50. That way you will be able to remember it much better. Flare on the other hand is graded as zero when there is no uh, uh, particle in that narrow beam between the two uh, beam lights, light beams. If there is faint opacification of this empty area, it's called one plus. If iris and lens details are clear, but there is slight whitish uh, streak to this band that you see between the corneal and the lenticular shadow. It's called 2+. plus. When the iris and the lenticular details become hazy and you are not able to make out what, what is there on the lens, then it's called 3+. plus. And when there is so much of a fibrinous deposit, it's called as 4+. plus. Hypopion may be present in cases with aridocyclitis and it should be reported separately from a cell grade. So the correct answer to our question, which was 3 plus flare is 26 to 50. Another question. Now this is a very clinical question. You might get an image, but there are certain very characteristic features of this entity. And many a times in uh, NEAT PG, even in the past, this entity has been asked. I have highlighted the characteristic features in yellow for you to pick them up. So the case goes like, even after refraction, vision of a 45-year-old Caucasian male does not become better than 6'9". 6'9", many people would count as close to normal and they might not even pay attention. But some people who are now in working environments where you require very good precise vision for them 6-9 can be disabling. Now this gentleman 
when he was examined by an ophthalmologist revealed a mild unilateral anterior chamber inflammation now remember unilateral one thing and stellate keratic precipitates diffusely dispersed now these keratic precipitates are not in the alls triangle they are not granulomatous because the world uses stellate stellate means star like small star like scattered throughout the cornea as you can see in this image the patient had brown iris with a mild difference of iris pigmentation between two eyes so the first clue was unilateral the second clue was uh, uh, stellate kps the third clue was these kps are spread throughout the fourth clue was that there is a difference in the iris color so what do you think is the diagnosis now the difference in the iris color itself is giving you a clue so the answer is fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis heterochromia means there is a difference in the color so you are answer is fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis other options were herpetic keratouveitis pigmentary glaucoma or none of the above now remember in herpetic keratouveitis there is quite a bit of inflammation there are lots of kps and in herpetic uveitis there is an elevated pressure and sometimes there are hemorrhages so hemorrhagic if you get a question of herpetic keratouveitis hemorrhage would be a part of it because it's a telltale sign which points towards herpes when you get iris pigment differentiation then the answer points towards fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis now let's have a look at this entity you might get some other version of an mcq for this entity it's also called as fuchs uveitis syndrome it is unilateral up to 15% of cases although may have some bilateral involvement without obvious heterochromia now here the lighter eye is the involved eye you can get a question in fuchs heterochromic uveitis lighter eye is the involved eye darker eye is the involved eye both the eyes are equally involved none of the eye is involved so in these questions remember lighter eye is the involved eye because because of chronic inflammatory process the iris cells are getting denuded from the surface of the iris there is diffuse iris stromal atrophy and there is also variable pigment epithelial layer atrophy since the pigment is getting lost the brown eyes will appear less brown but this is opposite for blue eyes so in caucasians the blue eyes will appear more blue there are small white star like or stellate kps that are diffusely present all over the corneal surface synechia are characteristically absent these patients also get cataract and glaucoma earlier than other forms of uveitis and very characteristic thing is that steroids are ineffective in this category so any question uh, can have these related traits related to this uh, entity and this is a very commonly asked entity in mcq so you must pay note to this so the correct answer for us was fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis and the clues i had already highlighted in yellow there's another entity which can be confusing and it, there are many questions which are asked related to this it's called as fuchs endothelial dystrophy now it can be confusing if this was one of the options in the mcq because you would think of fuchs and endothelium you will think that okay there was endothelial involvement with kps but remember this is a bilateral condition it is actually involving the cornea more than the other uh, more than the iris there is depletion of endothelial pump cells here and there is an entity called as gutte which is seen in the uh, posterior surface that is the endothelium and when there are these gutte they become confluent they become large they form an orange peel appearance so fuchs endothelial dystrophy you will get a pudy orange appearance of the endothelium or an orange peel appearance and the characteristic finding would be gutte and it would be bilateral there would be no associated uveitis or iritis right moving on to another question this is not precisely uvea but can be related to it 
which of the steroids is least likely to cause a posterior subcapsular cataract now steroids form the mainstay of treatment for uvi and usually when the inflammation is more marked we give dexamethasone or a stronger steroid of a similar category prednisolone or betamethasone these are the topical uh, steroids sometimes these patients may require a posterior subtenon injection of trimcinolone acetonide lotiprednol is a milder steroid so it is less likely to cause a posterior subcapsular cataract now this is a posterior subcapsular cataract sitting on the posterior capsule when the light hits the eye this light is broken into um, several rays and usually patients with posterior subcapsular cataract they complain of glare during daytime and difficulty in driving at night time because of this so the answer for us would be lotiprednol lotiprednol being a milder steroid has less intensity to cause cataract and less intensity to cause elevated intraocular pressure but it is given only if the inflammation is mild in a full blown aridocyclitis lotiprednol will not help another question which of the following drugs are known to cause anterior uveitis now remember these are not the drugs which are which we are going to give for treating uveitis these are the drugs which are causing uveitis some of them are systemic timolol rifabutin rifampicin or digoxin the culprits listed are systemic drugs rifabutin sidofovir biphosphonates sulfonamides and moxifloxacin amongst topical we have prostaglandin analogs bremonidine and metoprolol so these are the drugs which cause uveitis and this is a common question and uh, in past three or four exams i've come across this question so i think knowing a battery of these drugs which cause uveitis can help you answer questions related to this so the correct answer for us was rifabutin question uh, next question is about an entity which is called as posner schlossman syndrome also called as glaucomatocyclitic crisis the question is this condition has posterior synecae and peripheral anterior synecae it is associated with hypopion in majority cases prostaglandin analogs are mainstay of treatment for this entity and it's a self limiting condition now there are many questions that come related to this entity because it has characteristic features so you must know about this entity this is also unilateral just like fuchs heterochromic aridocyclitis it is recurrent the characteristic is it is seen in young individuals usually young males the pressure on of the eye it tends to rise up to 70 mm on this so 40 to 70 mm very high pressures that is because of inflammation of the trabeculum so trabeculitis and cyclitis are common despite very high pressures the clinical signs that you see in the eye are very less and it usually resolves on its own between few hours to several weeks and the differential for this is also fuchs heterochromic uveitis now since i mentioned that the signs are less this cannot be an option there will be no posterior synecae and no pass it is not associated with hypopion because hypopion is a very characteristic sign hemorrhagic hypopion is seen in herpetic keratoid uveitis but there is no hypopion which is there in this entity since it's a self limiting condition just prostaglandin analogs are not the mainstay since the pressure rises up to 40 or even 70 mm at time you need to give drugs like intravenous mannitol and oral acetazolamide to bring down the pressure but not prostaglandin analogs and as i mentioned earlier it's a self limiting condition so um, it resolves on its own the correct answer for this would be self limiting condition the next question entails matching of the following diseases and their hla association which is incorrect so you are given a battery of conditions and uh, you are also told about the hla which is related to them 
these are the options now uh, this is something you will have to memorize and you have to read properly whether we are talking about an incorrect option or a correct option in this so that is something that you have to read uh, and uh, there is a table for this uh, you need to see this table in this what you can do is you can remember by the first alphabet and the numerical that is given along with it so uh, we have hla a11 associated with sympathetic ophthalmitis a29 associated with birdshot retinochoroidopathy b5 with bechets b7 with histoplasmosis and so on so uh, you will have this webinar on uh, available as a youtube option eventually you can go down and take a screenshot of this uh, slide and memorize this so this is a common question that can come in your neat pg exam so the correct answer for this one was the incorrect combination was for cicatrical pemphigoid another question bilateral granulomatous panuveitis now panuveitis means it is involving all the layers of the uvea associated with parotid enlargement now panuveitis and parotid two characteristic clues p and p so you are giving some syndromic associations answers could be from herfords reiter's bechet's or toxoplasmosis now herford syndrome involves panuveitis it is associated with fever parotid enlargement and facial palsy characteristically i think this fits the answer <clears throat> let's have a look at bechet's disease in bechet's the characteristic thing is oral and penile ulcers or uh, other genital ulcers in the uh, perigenital area there is bilateral uveitis in this condition but it also has autoimmune vasculitis and bloody diarrhea so if the options included bilateral panuveitis with bloody diarrhea and systemic vasculitis your answer would have been bechets in uh, uh, reactive arthritis or writer syndrome remember the patient cannot see it the patient cannot pee and they cannot bend their knee so conjunctivitis for not being able to see there is element of conjunctival edema associated with a bit of corneal edema urethritis because of which he cannot pee and arthritis because of which he cannot bend their knee so our question panuveitis and parotid fitted into herfords waldenstrom syndrome for toxoplasmosis one of the characteristic things that is there in the uh, question uh, stem would be head light and fog appearance so in this the vitreous has a characteristic head light and fog appearance so that would give you the clue so for us the answer was herford syndrome the next question is of a 77 year old woman who presents with deteriorating vision in the left eye for several years on examination the eye is red and inflamed it is painful the pressure in the eye is 60 mm if the pressure is this high the cornea always becomes steamy and because of the steamy nature of the cornea um, you will not be able to actually elucidate the details underlying it very well the pressure in the other eye is normal as i mentioned there's corneal edema the anterior chamber is deep now this is something which will give you the clue anterior chamber is deep and you can see this brownish uh, uh, sort of deposition in the uh, lower part of the anterior chamber there is flare in cells and the rest of the lens is white so white lens brownish uh, deposition in the anterior chamber so the options are most likely diagnosis is fuchs heterochromic uveitis we have heard about the features for this entity and i don't think they fit in here we have phacolytic glaucoma phacolytic means lytic phaco refers to lens so the lens is getting lysed there is proteinaceous breakdown that is causing the release of proteinaceous stuff from the lens which is eventually depositing here and you have a cataract this lens another option is phacomorphic glaucoma in which there is intumescent lens now if the lens is swollen it will cause shallowing of the anterior chamber 
But remember, we had the term deep anterior chamber. So it is unlikely to be phacomorphic glaucoma. And the fourth option is posner schlossmann uveitis. We have seen that in posner schlossmann uveitis, there is no flare, there is no cells, and there is a unlikely uh, hypopion as is there in this condition because of the lenticular uh, proteins that have leaked out. So the answer most probably goes towards a phacolytic glaucoma. Now, in phacolytic glaucoma, when the cataractus lens becomes, the capsule becomes weak, it releases these proteins, uh, the lens proteins, which are denatured, these lens proteins eventually settle in the anterior chamber. Now, if something is getting leaky, the lens becomes thinner. When the lens becomes thinner, the iris falls back thereby causing increased depth of the anterior chamber. So, phacolytic fits the entire bill of this question and the answer is phacolytic glaucoma. Phacomorphic, it becomes swollen. In phacoantigenic glaucoma, there is normal lens protein which is leaking into the anterior chamber after trauma or capsule disruption. And there is inframed granulomatous response. So you would see those granulomatous nodules. You will have very prominent KPs, but you will also have history of some trauma or some surgery. So in presence of a swollen lens, the answer would be phacomorphic. In presence of a deep anterior chamber, cataractus lens with leaky settlement in the anterior chamber, the answer would be phacolytic. And in cases where there is some trauma or some surgery done to the lens, but still you have granulomatous inflammation, the answer would be to pointing towards phacoantigenic glaucoma. So these are some of the etiological and triggering factors for each of these entities. For phacolytic, the triggering factor is protein solubility and capsule incompetence. And the treatment for this is lens extraction. For lens particle glaucoma, which happens after a penetrating trauma or surgery, again, lens extraction is something needs to be done. So basically, you have to take the root cause out. And once the root cause is out, the inflammation will up subside on its own and the pressures will also come down. So the correct answer for our question was phagolytic glaucoma. So I would conclude this session with some tips. I have asked you all the questions today of one theme that is uvia so whenever you are practicing for mcqs go topic wise read all the questions related to cataract all the questions related to retina or uvia in one go so that you are building up your concepts side by side so today i talked about posner scholzman syndrome i talked about herpetic uveitis i talked about fuchs heterochromic aridocyclitis i made you see some of the images such as keratotic precipitates or cells or flare so that you have a concept related to them so now today you go and consolidate uvia follow a systematic approach so that these things they strengthen in your mind See the clinical images of different entities that you're reading. Now you have so much of uh, data available on Google or YouTube or any other web platform and even on Instagram too. So see the clinical images so that your mind knows and retains what it has seen. Because image recall is always better than text recall. Look at various online resources in the form of cartoons like fun schematics, you know. If there is something funny or it's related with a pun, you will always remember it for longer. So images, schematics, they help you retain. And revise today so that you can comprehend what I had talked about. This is just a small snapshot of what can be, but it is just giving you an idea that when you are preparing, look at each option. Once you have read about each of the options, you will not have to mug up the condition. Any question related to that entity, you will be able to answer. So I hope it helped you.